Mike, welcome to 10% Truth. Thanks for coming on the channel. Well, 100%, thank you for <laughs> inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> um, you. You and I have not spoken before. This is the first time we've, we've um, spoken. That's, that's we right, arranged yeah. this interview many weeks ago. So thank you for your patience and thanks for uh, sticking to um, the calendar and not, and not bailing ah, on me. My pleasure. Um, but, I, but I do know <laughs> you from your writing. So you have written a number of books. I haven't read your Javelin book yet, but yeah. I will do. Uh, well, you um, should do. I, I, if it's as good as the first two on Tornado, then <laughs> I, I won't be disappointed. Um, um, and what I'm hoping is that we will get uh, through the course of the next hour or so a, a little flavour of what's in your books, find out a little bit about your experience as a, a fast jet pilot yeah. in the Royal Air Force. Yeah. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Then, how, how did you get into the, the flying business? Did you always want to? Did you always want to be a pilot? Yeah, I, th I think every little boy wants to be either a pilot or a train driver. And then most little boys grow out of that and go and get a proper job. But I never grew out of it. So <laughs> that was me, I'm afraid. I'm still a six-year-old at heart. And yeah, I was just so lucky. I, I mean, one of the things about aviation is some people believe that they get to where they get to because they're good. But most of us realize we get to where we get to because we're incredibly lucky and in the right place at the right time. And I was. I was just so, so lucky in the right place at the right time. Um, join, always wanted to join the RAF, managed to do so because it was a time when the RAF was recruiting heavily, needed, you know, if you had two arms and two legs and uh, knew your own name, which I just about did, then you were in. And uh, so that was me. And I, I joined as a university cadet. Um, so they not, not only let me join the RAF, they actually paid me to go to university, which is uh, quite, uh, everybody else impoverished on their, on their student grants at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and I was actually quite well off. Um, and and it went from there really. So I joined as a university cadet, uh, went through my flying training, um, and um, some of which I didn't enjoy, some of which I did, uh, and then ended up um, being selected for the tornado, which was still reasonably new in service then in um, in eighty five when I when I when I got to fly it, and I arrived out at Bruggen in Germany in the back end of uh, nineteen eighty five on fourteen brackets designate. Uh, close bracket squadron, which was the Tornado squadron working up to take over from 14 Squadron Jaguars, uh, which we did, I, th I can't remember the date now, I think it's something like 1st of October, um, 85, um, we became 14 Squadron uh, equipped with the Tornado and based at Bruggen, and um, our two roles, nuclear strike and uh, and then attack, um, ground attack. It, um, it's a it's a heavy subject um, to start with, but but let's let's just quickly go there. You, you said right at the beginning then that um, a lot of it's to do with luck. I do remember talking to somebody once <clears> and I said, well, you know, how do you feel about people when they say you're lucky to be a fighter pilot? Um, and he said, well, I, I resent it a little because it's incredibly hard work. You really have to apply yourself. Um, it's not okay. So yes, you have to be physically <laughs> fit. You need to be born with the the eyesight, um, no hay fever, no asthma, all the things that typically people get sort of uh, thrown out for if in, in terms of the recruitment yeah. selection process. Um, did you have to work hard then? Incredibly hard. I mean, I, I had to work, you know, uh, I wouldn't even say that I was the swan sort of um, looking serene on top and paddling underneath. I, I was, bloody, <laughs> I, I had to work really, really hard to basically, I mean, yeah, to, to be pretty average, really. Um, no, I found it incredibly difficult. And looking back now, I realised that I was, incredibly naive as well as I went through through the training I kind of took every day as it came out really thinking very far ahead without really understanding I wonder I'd gone through school really I mean I'm, I suppose I'm lucky to be relatively intelligent I can sort of generally get by with what well, I don't really um, or not listening but can kind of put piece things together and work it out from there and I realize now look, looking back sort of almost 40 years later that that's probably how much of my flying training went or really you know things it's quite funny so I'm reliving it now because my son uh, is going through flying training in the RAF and you know, as, as he's doing things, I'm thinking, God, he's really, he's really switched on. He can really, you know, he's seeing all these things that I never really thought of at the time when I was doing it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was incredibly hard work. It was draining. It was emotionally draining. It was sometimes physically draining. Um, you know, I, I was so again lucky that I went through my main flying courses with the same bunch of guys who are now amongst my closest friends because we kind of went through the ringer together. And we were there for each other. We, you know, we helped each other both practically and and emotionally uh, through. Well, it was about three years worth of uh, of really. Um, it was really tough flying training. You, know, you you had to meet the standard. If you didn't, you got kicked out. It's as simple as that. Um, and you know, so so for all those reasons, what you say is absolutely correct. It is it is really hard work. It, you know, you really have to apply yourself. You have to really believe in yourself. And that's on occasions when you find yourself not believing yourself you've got to somehow refine that uh, that self-belief 
and that that sort of self confidence. Um, and it you have to really dig deep into your psychological reserves. I mean, you do it is it is tough. But that said, ultimately, you know, it it's a lot of it's down to luck. You know, it, what what was who who who's your instructor? What's it, what's he like? You know, in my case, what was the rest of the course like? Do they help you? Do they try and you know, do they try and score points off you? Um, is your instructor good or bad? Is the examiner in a good mood that day? Is the weather all right? You know, does the airplane work? All those things and. Um, you know, or and even as some of the guys found, you know, in, about ten years ago, does the Air Force still want you? Um, and again, I was lucky because the Air Force was desperately short of tornado pilots. That's what it needed, and uh, you know, that's where I ended up going. So, yeah, you're right; it is hard work. But if anybody ever says to you that luck isn't a sort of major factor, <laughs> yeah, maybe thirty percent, maybe higher than that, then uh, I'm afraid they're either living in cloud cuckoo land or, or telling little porky pies. <laughs> what, what, you said that you parts of it you enjoyed, parts of it you didn't. What did you not enjoy? I found the whole of. I did my basic flying training. In fact, let me step back. I did my. I was on the University of London Air Squadron, and I pitched up there on day one, feeling very proud of myself, having got into the Air Force. Um, and uh, we, there were. F- Four of us, I think, all doing the same course at Imperial College, and we we're all university guys, and all fun. Yeah, we we're all pretty proud of ourselves and thought we were, we were wonderful and special. And um, we arrived on the squadron. And they said, "Oh, well done, yeah." And uh, the, the, I should point out on university, university air squadrons, there, there, there were two sorts of people. There, there were university cadets, which was us, paid for by the Air Force, and they're what they call VR volunteer reserve members, who are people who who could join in with no commitment, uh, join for two years, learn to fly, and then um, decide what they wanted to do. And these VR guys were all joining on the same day and they were told, yes, you can go flying, you can go flying. And we pitched up and said, oh, and, and we're well, university you know, cadets, so obviously we go to the front of the queue. And they said, no, you don't. The Air Force is paying you to be at university, so you will not do anything other than, and sit, you, know, you, you will work all year, you will pass your exams, and if you pass your exams, then you can fly. Um, but when I did get to fly the Bulldog, I, I did really enjoy it. It was good fun. It was, it was hard work, but it was great. And then I went to Cranwell, where everything changed, where the sort of lovely world of, of the University of Escort turned into something, oh, I don't know, it was just, the officer training was just uh, interminable trivia. And it was, I don't mind things being tough. And the tough bits I actually enjoyed and did well, but it was just the utter mindless trivia which really caught to me so I, I ended up enduring that and then of course everybody else well, not everybody else but when you were dreamed to go to your basic fl- uh, flying training which in those days there were three bases all, all flying training on the jet provost um, if you had been to university and got to um, what the court was called uh, I think it's Cranwell Entry Standard uh, on the uh, on the Bulldog then you went to Cranwell um, otherwise you went to either Linton on Ouse or Church Fenton up in Yorkshire and um, and of course, all the guys who went off to to Church Fenton and Linton got away from the trivia of Cranwell and, and really enjoyed themselves. Um, I'll, as I'll tell you later on, they they, they they got bitten in the bum later on. But um, the rest of those who, who had done quite a lot of bulldog fly ended up at Cranwell. And I have to say, I I hate that place with a vengeance. It, and, and I didn't enjoy. I was there for you know for, for a, follow, a year doing the, the flying training course, and I you know. The social side was fantastic because I was so lucky. I was with a bunch of really, really good blokes. Um, and, you know, so we're all, we're all close friends now, um, you know, 30, 40 years out on. But, um, no, I, I hated it. I found it very, very difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as mentioned before, that was really drawing deep into the sort of psychological reserves and, uh, and the will to, to carry on, etc. But then after that, I went to Valley. And uh, for me, um, and the other guys on my course, uh, Valley was this breath of, breath of fresh air. It was just so it, a real sort of atmosphere of you got there. It's excitement, uh, you know, the wind blowing off the north, the Irish Sea, and the you know blowing the the, the fumes of Avta, uh, hawks flashing around, and this great excitement of fast jet flying and and, and all the rest of it. And it was brilliant, a really lovely atmosphere, and uh, and we thought it was fantastic. Because we'd spent our time at Cranwell, of course, the guys who'd, who'd had a holiday for a year in, in Yorkshire <laughs> were used to, you know, pitching up to Yorkshire pubs and having a great time, and they thought it was a dump. <laughs> but um, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, Valley was fantastic. The Hawk was fantastic. Um, we then had a bit of a, a an interrupt in our in our training, um, which at the time was I, I thought was dreadful. It's about it's about three or four months, I think. Or maybe it was even six months that, that, that between finishing at Valley when we got our wings and, and starting the tactical weapons uh, unit, which was the next course that we had to do, 
Um, I say that, that seemed an terminally long time. My son just had two years worth of holding between courses, so perhaps six months is nothing really. But then we arrived at Chivener, um, and again, it was it was really hard work. And again, luck played a a, um, a massive part because I ended up on firstly on there were two squadrons at Chivener, one of which was very very hard nosed, and basically, if your face didn't fit, you got the chop very swiftly. The squadron that I was on was actually much more amenable. But there again, I think we our course went there with the attitude that we were going to make it all happen. So, we, you know, I, I think they, they kind of, um, uh, they felt that our face fitted anyway. So, but, so we did all right on that. But it was it was hard work. Um, and again, I was also lucky that ours was a an experimental course that we were given. Those of us who, because normally what happens is you had to get to the whole end of the course and then it was decided what airplane you'd fly. With R1, halfway through the course, they decided whether you were going to fly a single-seat airplane, the, the Harrier or the, or the Jaguar, um, or two-seat at that stage, the Tornado or the, or the Phantom. Um, and I was streaming Tornado, so I was actually given a, navig- a student navigator to, to, to fly the last few sources, which were the kind of really hard work ones on the course. And actually, that was quite good, because I, I, it meant that I had a bit of a helping hand, um, whereas... If I'd been on the other squad, I'd have a been given a hard time by the the instructors, who are who are a bunch of heartless bastards, and and b have had to do it all myself. Um, again, I did later get to do the course myself because I went back to instruct there and I had to, had to pass the course as a student first to do that. But um, yeah, so th- that was that was kind of um, both enjoyable and hard work. So um, you know, UAS good fun. Um, and fairly light-hearted. Cranwell, absolute hard work and a disaster, not very enjoyable. Uh, Valley, really good fun, really enjoyable. Um, and Chivner, sort of a bit of, bit of a mixture. And then on to the Tornado, well, Triple T, Tornado, Tri-National Tornado Training Establishment, which was at Cottesmore, which was the, it was a tri-national, so um, Germans, Italians, and Brits. Um, and that was actually a real breath of fresh air because the RF flying training um, system was kind of, um, as I said, it's really hard nosed, and it was right. This this is the standard. This is what you need to do. Can you do it? Yes, no. If you can't, then you're out. Find a new job. Um, the Italians and Germans took a different view. They thought they said, "Well, we, we've we've taught you this far, and we now need to teach you how to fly the tornado, and therefore we'll teach you how to fly the tornado, and not give you our time." So it was a sort of a three or four month holiday there as one learned to fly this um, this amazing machine. Um, I'm not quite sure how much I learned there because um, there's nothing like being under the microscope to make you sort of buck your game up. But uh, I remember I was, I was actually crewed up with a, a guy called Mike O'Connor, who was a, a major, I think he got promoted, I think he became a lieutenant colonel while we were there, an American guy on, on exchange. I think he was going to the um, Takeval, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think he was he was going to the Takeval team at Ramstein, uh, who did all the tactical evaluations for NATO. And I think the Germans, I think, had paid for him to be qualified on Tornado. But anyway, I, I, I just remember he and I getting airborne in this Tornado, and neither of us really had a clue as to what was going on at all. And he, I mean, he was a very, very experienced guy, so he was stuck with this numb nuts mic in, you know, in the front who didn't really know what was going on, with him trying to do his best you know, in this foreign aeroplane in this foreign country. <laughs> Poor bloke. I don't think I don't think you know what hit him really, but um, yeah. So again, that was fun. But then after that, the, the, the pendulum swung the other way, like it always does. And we went to the Tornado Weapons Conversion Unit, which was the RAF unit. So having learned to fly the Tornado um, as just a pure airplane, just the sort of um, you know how, how to fly it, how to operate it as a as a war system. So pretty much the Tactical Weapons Unit course, uh, you know, really flown in the Tornado. And again, that was um, well. Very, very hard nose. You face fits or you get out. But I was, again, very lucky that I think some of the instructors kind of took a bit. Of, I think they felt sorry for me, actually. <laughs> but they, they took me under their wing and they uh, they sorted me out and said, don't worry, Mike, we'll get you through. And, uh, you know, I was internally grateful. They did actually just sort of, you know, keep, yeah, sweeten my path through. I, I, was, I was just so so lucky, again, with, with characters, with people. And um I think there were three or four guys in particular who, who, who decided it was their mission to get me through, which they did. And so I pitched up at, um, at Bruggen. I suspect as a bit of a sort of training risk. I think that the, the squadron looked and went, mm, yeah, whatever. Um, but, um, but yeah, then, then on my squadron and, uh, and, and uh, it's, I slowly sort of the momentum gained from there, really. Um, 
but yeah, I kind of just scraped through really. <laughs> Let, let's pick up on the tornado aspect of that in, yeah. in, in a minute, but but I just want to take you back then um, to the tactical weapons unit at uh, Chivna and and yes. find the, the yeah. walk at uh, Valley. One of the rides, and I don't know if this would have been one where you had your 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 navigator with you, but one of the rides I I know about in, I think it's the tactical weapons course, is the low level attack right where you have to plan a low level you fly through the valleys of wales simulate a, yeah. a, a, a bomb drop against the target and then come home and, and what they'll do is harry you by intercepting you with other aircraft or maybe an instructor yes. will, yeah. will give you a heading change or something like that can you talk a little bit about the challenge and the complexities of flying something like a hawk at 420 knots at 200 feet through valleys, map reading. This is pre GPS, pre um, yeah. situational display indicators, nothing, no moving map, uh, clock, compass, ground. Can you talk about that process? Yes. Well, it, it was, as you said, just all of those things, except that um, when I went through Chivener, the hawk there was a was the T1 and we had been at Valley I think it was the T1A and the difference was a thing called the AHARS now AHARS um, is the I'm trying to it, it's basically the attitude heading reference system and there's probably another way in there I think heading and something reference system but so the ones that we've flown at um, at um, at Valley were all modded and they had this wonderful system. So basically you went off and you flew aerobatics or you went and do a low level navigation and you had a, a an ostrich horizon that said where it was. You had a um a, a gyro compass that 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 um it remained slave to the um the, the compass so you always had accurate um headings and the rest of it. But at Chivna they they had the old system, which was useless basically. And it was designed if you're flying along a straight in straight lines, then um then it worked fine. But at Chivna, all the turns that we did were tactical turns at 4G. So you went into a turn at 4G. Now, this thing toppled at about sort of one and a half g So you'd go into the turn thinking, I have to roll out heading, whatever it is. And then you'd go whack 4G. And then the next thing you look down, you just see your compass rose just spinning around and around. So you had no idea. So then you had to get into the thing of going along, look at the map, thinking, right, my next heading is 320. And that's about that's sort of over to the left. So, right, that's going to be over there. What's that? At? Right, there's a wood over there. So if I head towards, you know, come at this turn heading towards the wood, I'm roughly right. And I'll work it out from there. And But further complicated by the fact that you're flying in formation. Now, not formation like the Red Arrows. Uh, battle formation is in you're in line abreast. And the reason for that is that when you're flying along, um, you can't see what's behind your own airplane. So, and funny old thing, that's where most people come through. They're going to shoot you down. They come, generally come from behind you and shoot you down. So big problem. So the way around that is that you fly, um, it's about two kilometers apart. And that means that, it's been, that you can then look at your buddy's, uh, the area behind your buddy's airplane and check that he's clear. Um, and he can do the same for you. Um, and you know that you're going to be um, you're going to be bounced by another airplane, you know, a, you know, a, a, a simulated fighter. So you and you know that if your buddy gets shot down, it's going to be your fault. So you spend so now you've got to navigate, but you're actually spending your whole time like that looking behind you. So you've got to navigate when you come to doing the turn. That's your next heading is three two zero, which is over there by the wood, as we said you're not going to turn that way because your buddy's this side. So what you're going to do is you're going to turn the other way, 4G. You're going to cross over, remembering who has to avoid who. And then as you cross over, you're going to reverse back and pull 4G back again to point at the wood <laughs> that you mentioned before. So uh, this is all going on. And as you come out of that turn, you're then looking behind you to see that there's nobody behind his, uh, you know, behind his airplane, looking as far back as you can. At the same time, you're trying to find this wood on that there is. You're trying to check out the map. You're trying to re-erect your gyro compass that's now spinning madly. <laughs> and so it continues. So it was, I mean, it, um, one of the things, and I can remember someone saying it, and, and it has ha it happened to me on numerous occasions, is that you, and I think it was the, I don't know if you saw a, a program called Fighter Pilot, which is, came out in the, the early 80s. And that was the kind of model of my life, you know, as we, we watched it in awe as, uh, uh, as, they, as they ran the series, just as we started our basic flying training. Um, and one of the guys saying that you end up so maxed out that if somebody asks you your name, you don't, you don't know it because you can't process that information. And that was exactly what it's like. You go off for this 30 or 45 minute sortie with your wingman, um, trying to navigate, formate, look out, 
<laughs> not flying to the hills and all those things and your your brain was just so max loaded um you know flying around and doing 40 turns and all the rest of it particularly you you as you say you you'd be on you'd be on the route and then suddenly you'd get bounced so you then have to counter towards so you're now doing 40 turn towards and and fighting this other guy and then you have to get back again to gather information and you have to get back onto the track and um trying to do all that based just on a map and a stopwatch and a compass that doesn't really work um was uh, was 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 mind boggling actually it really was absolutely mind boggling and mind blowing um uh, so yeah it was uh, it, it was an exercise in um uh, yeah in in um in prioritizing and multitasking and all, and all those things um and it's great it's great practice for fly flying proper airplanes but um yeah it was it was hard hard work and i say f mentally certainly draining and physically you know tough as well 40 turns and um, and all the rest of it so did, did it yeah. get easier um and the reason i asked that question is because i don't know did you do it enough that over time your you know your cognitive capacity increased because you were able to perform, perform some of those tasks without really thinking about it or was it the case that you just had to prove you could do it and then you got onto the tornado and the jet did a lot of the or the nav did a lot of the work for you at that point yes it was um uh, yes to both of those questions because like everything the more you do something the more you uh you know, the more pra you practice the better you get uh, on the course as a student you were taught just enough to, to to tick each box, so you were you were always working at capacity. Uh, to jump forward a bit, when I went back to Chivna to instruct, I had to do the course again as a student um, on my own this time because I think uh, you know, I haven't been used to flying around the inertial nav and, and, and the navigator. I had neither, um, and I actually did have to do the course myself this time. Um, but I found it much easier, and then of course when I went to instruct, I could do it. Again, much much more easy. I mean, it's still hard work, but uh, but you you know you 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 work it out and, and you can do that. And you've got spare capacity to keep an eye on your you know on your student and uh, and 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 monitor how he's doing and everything else, as well as keeping a pic the big picture. But to go back to your point about the tornado, yes, it was a, an exercise in in teaching you the basics of what you needed to know, uh, measuring your measuring your mental capacity to a certain extent. You know, can you particularly are you going to go you know, well? A are you capable of flying a faster airplane um, tactically? Um, are you capable of doing that on your own, or do you need somebody to help you? Um, and the guys who could do it on, you know, well, I guess we could all do it on our own. So, can you do it on your own brackets and not kill yourself? Um, and the guys who who you know who, who met that criteria went off to fire the Harrier or Jaguar, but even so, some did manage to kill themselves. Um, and uh, the, the rest of us went off to the Tornado or Phantom, where uh, yeah, we had a, a helping hand. And in the case of Tornado, you know, fantastic helping hand in terms of the the, the navigation kit. Um, because it was, yeah, it was a very, very you know, complex, swept up, um, and and um, capable airplane, um, and it did take all of that load of, if you like, trivia off you, such that you could concentrate on the tactical situation, so that you had a, you know, you, you could keep an eye on what was going on and have a big, you know, good situational awareness of what was happening around you, um, and fight the airplane more efficiently. Before we hit record, you you and I were just having our intro chat because, as, as I said yeah. at the beginning, we've never spoken before. So just to sort of break the ice, and you said you watched the Adam Robinson video. So maybe I'll put a link, yes. put a link somewhere in the description. Yeah, yeah. You can go and watch those. But he, he talked a little bit about the tornado from a nav's point of view. Um, talked about the you know the navigation system, the, mm. the TF and and uh, weapon system to some degree. What was your um, impression then of the aeroplane? What were the if you could pick three things about your introduction to it, what, what stood out to you? Uh, firstly, that it was a very uh, straightforward airplane to fly. Um, most of the other airplanes that, uh, that predated it had um, were um, had some sort of uh, handling difficulty. Phantom, I think, it was quite a handful in the circuit. I think the Buccaneer was was uh, as well. Jaguar was. Um, an awful lot, I think, was was also quite a handful of an airplane to fly. You know, I think once you got it pointing a straight line and above four hundred knots, it was great. But uh, you know, all those airplanes, I think, below that speed would be quite a handful. Um, would have vices, have areas of of of, of the flight envelope that you really wouldn't want to go near. Um, Harrier was, I think, an absolute. You know, a shopping trolley, or you know, Chris Packet, and all those things. You know, all floated together. You know, I think. I mean, the the, the best guys went to the Harrier undoubtedly, and the, and it needed the best guys. Um, you know, there's a question mark then about is that the best way to employ your best guys? Do you, you know do do you send them on to the, the hardest airplane to fly, or do you, you know, 
should you send them to the easy airplane flight to make them the best tactical pilots? I don't know, Qu uh, argument. But um, in terms of macho stuff, yeah, the Harrier was the machine. The Tornado was none of those. It was a very, um, I, de I use the word docile uh, in a way um, because it, it did, it, it flew much like the Hawk actually in many respects. Um, it, it, it was, it was more slow. It wasn't as agile as the Hawk. It wasn't as springy. It wasn't, you know, it was a, um, yeah, the, the, the Hawk was a kind of like a, a little um, Jack Russell kind of yap, yap, yap. Um, the, the, the Tornado was more of a sort of, you know, large sort of Labrador that lollops along. Um, but um, it, it was, it was comfortable and it was pleasant to fly and it was, dare I say, easy to fly. So you didn't have to worry about handling or anything like that because the airplane would look after you in general. It could bite your bum a couple of times, but you know, all airplanes do. But it was in general a very benign airplane to fly. Um, in, so that's probably the first thing, and that, that's all through the wing sweeps. Uh, wing sweep, um, worth talking about a little bit. Um, the, basically, if you're gonna fly very fast, then you need a swept wing. If you wanna fly very slowly, then you need a straight wing. And so the tornado got around that by having both, you know, so when you wanted to land it or take it off or maneuver hard, you pop the wings forward. So that's 25 degrees was that was fully forward. Um, you could go all the way back to 67 wing. Um, so that's swept all the way back. And um, <clears throat> that was really, that kind of came into it own, its own if you got above about five or 600 knots, uh, which was, which is going some and was also above the kind of speed limits because the, the, the speed limits um and that sounds a bit silly but but basically all our training was done at 420 knots as, as a cruising speed um and you could go up to 480 knots on ip target uh, sorry between the um initial point of the target of target simulated attacks um if it was supposedly a strike uh, a nuclear weapon then you could um or stimulated nuclear weapon you would uh you'd, you'd fly the attack at 540 knots um but those, particularly in Germany, were very well regulated. There were um, Germans had uh, radar systems out to. to it's, a bit, it's a bit like the, the police and the speed guns, you know, speed cameras. <clears throat> Literally, that's what they had. A couple of um, I can't remember what the, um, one of the anti-aircraft systems <clears throat> with with video cameras, and they'd go out and they park these things out on their flying areas, and they would um, <clears throat> they would film you and track your radar. So, and if you're going too fast, then, you know, there'd be a, a surety letter be sent to uh, HQRF Germany and uh, you'd be invited for you know, for an interview with, uh, you know, without two medals and without wearing your hat. And they'd be told if you did it again, you'd be out you know, on your ear. So, um, <clears throat> so most of our flying was done in intermediate sweeps. Now the airplane, the wings could be swept anywhere intermediate. You had, you had a lever on, on the left-hand side out there, uh, just in board of throttles and fully full was 25 and you'd sweep it back as you got airborne. Except that um, the because every speed had a different uh, li set of limitations in terms of G limits. Uh, or, sorry, every sweep had a, 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 a different limitation: speed limits, G limits, um, everything else. Um, it was made easy uh, by having one one for everything. So one one for one wing sweep that did everything. So basically, it went back to forty five wings. So there was a detent. So you, you come back a bit like uh, the gears in a car. You know, first, second, third. It went clunk, and you're in forty five, and then you went clunk again. You're in sixty seven. I mean, you could stop it in between, um, but generally speaking, you got airborne, and at about three sixty knots, you popped it back into forty five wing and left it there till you ended up maneuvering hard. Um, and but the result of that was that the, the airplane um, behaved. Again, very, you know, very, very, in a very docile and predictable manner, really, uh, at all speeds, and gave you a really comfortable ride at low level. So, other airplanes get bounced around, um, but the tornado would just cut through turbulence and was, again, a very comfortable ride, and, uh, which again makes life easy because it's less less tiring for you. You can look out, you can, um, you know, uh, you can keep an eye on what's going on. You, you're not constantly being buffeted around and, uh, and having to worry about that. Um, uh, and so, those ease of flying in terms of pure flying um the, the 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 solid ride at low level um and and then the the cleverness really the terrain following system and and the, the whole sort of navigation system itself when it was all tied together now when i was going through flying training people said oh you don't want to go to the tornado because all that stuff's on the terrain following radar and you know that's uh you know that'd be no fun you spend your time like a you know sort of like, you know um you're know, like a monkey sat on a cruise missile but the reality was that we didn't use the terrain following radar very much in day-to-day -day flying but when we did use it which was at night time or um, when we went out to Canada in daylight, but you know, poor weather, it was a phenomenal bit of kit because you'd get airborne and, and you'd set the thing up, and 
it would fly you, you program it to fly a route and it would take you around this route and you'd be as a pilot you there with you know so your hand ready to, to take control of the thing you know so it looked like it's going to fly into the ground keep in mind there's a radar screen that you, you know showing you the, the ground ahead so you'd be looking at that the navigator would have his radar behind and he'd be giving you a commentary as, as, as um uh, of what was ahead and particularly the, the great thing was cut off uh, which is if a radar looks at something but obviously if 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 it can't see anything behind it because it, you're looking at a hill and you can't see what's beyond the hill then then you've got you've got a cut off so the, the the navigator would call it got cut off at 10 miles and then would march you down and then on our e-scope in the front seat you'd see the cut off it looked at about six miles so at six miles you'd see this cut off coming and then as the radar as the terrain following radar we, we crested the ridge and looked then you get you know uh, painting beyond so you then tell the navigator what you're doing so we end up with sort of a uh, cadence of talking to each other about what each of you could see on the radar and in the front seat you'd be keeping on the train that you know the, making sure the train following radar was working make sure the autopilot was working and it, it was very rewarding um in 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 many um senses but both for, from a single aircraft perspective because you'd be flying on, and you'd be flying towards you know perhaps a, a daytime you'd, you'd come out of cloud and you'd suddenly find yourself um you know in the middle of a valley or pointing towards a, a rock first surface and it then pull you back up into cloud again and, and then you'd go over it and it was you know truly miraculous to see how the thing worked but also we um and i, I think adam mentioned it when we plan sorties we planned them as either twos or fours and you'd plan each airplane would have its own route um four kilometers which was to, uh, battle formation on the uh, tornado four kilometers apart um and so you'd each of you would fly this this route uh, on your own time but when you popped out from cloud and this was the whole idea of it you'd be back into visual flying so you'd then go back to visual formation looking out and then if you came back to cloud again you could pop in your your autopilot uh, again and it would take you back onto your route and then by making sure you flew the timeline correctly you knew that next time you popped out of cloud you'd be back into um, defensive battle formation again and that again was a really particularly at night time um, when we do it you'd see these flashing lights of your mate on you know four kilometers away shadowing you around this route and then you'd split off in different directions because it, uh, over the target you had to be um because of the self damage i.e., if you drop your bombs and your mate flies through them he'll get damaged so you'd have to you, you you drop your bombs and your mate would then come through 40 seconds later such that all the the, the debris and everything from your own weapons had, had dissipated and so you'd then split and then of course, after that, after you've gone through the target, you then got to do, do the opposite um, to then meet up again, to put yourself back in formation again to carry on the route. So, seeing all that pan out uh, uh, as you, you know, uh, as you did, as you did it, and, and sort of monitoring all this kit and seeing it all working was, I, I found it uh, incredibly rewarding actually. So, I, those are the three things that I take away. You know, the handling characteristics of the airplane, um, the you know, the, the particular benefits of, of, of the variable geometry of, of, of the wing sweep. Um, and also this incredibly complex um, and very impressive um, terrain following system, which meant that you really could go in any weather um, at low level, which was, was something that never, never really been done before. You know, people could fly at low level. Uh, you know, the Air Force had chosen low level flying from you know, in the early 1960s, but you could only do that, A, at daytime and B, in good weather. So that sort of took about sort of 75 percent of the, of the opportunity, really. But now, you know, 100 percent, you know, every, day or night whatever the weather we could launch and and, and we could go and, and hit the enemy so uh, you know it's, it's an incredibly potent uh, weapon system i, I did uh, interview <clears throat> an f-111 guy marco mccaffrey i'll put a link to the oh, yeah. in the description <clears throat> of this one as well but he, he talked a little bit about the tf uh, on the auto tf on the f-111 uh, and yeah. he mentioned you know it was auto tf in the sense it would fly you in a straight line but it wouldn't turn you and he he recalled flying in a valley once he was he was in between uh, sort of cliff faces, if you will, um, mm. and he sort of got a sense that something wasn't right. And his, his wizard said to him, "Yeah, we're, we're we're flying down a valley," and I said to him, "You know, how, how would?" Because um, at this point, when talking to him, I didn't know that it wouldn't turn him. Um, I said, "Well, how right, would yes. it work if you were in a, in the valley and you turned?" He said, "It wouldn't turn. It would just fly you out through the valley when the next ridge ridge line appeared." So, if the tornado um, TF could fly you along a route, would it re require you? in the planning process to not put it into a valley where it could potentially turn to leave the valley. So roll and actually then fly into the side of the valley because the radar didn't have the ability to look up into the turn. Um, well, 
I'm not. I think we. I think we had the same system as the F one eleven. I think the F one eleven had two, two TFLs, and we just had one. But as I remember, it actually did a. It changed when you came to a turn. It it changed its scan, and it did actually look into the turn. And I think it did a figure of. I think it, it, it usually a raster scan. Then it looks across. It did a figure eight uh, scan into the turn. Um, so it did to an extent look into the turn. But as it turned looking in, um, it would. Yeah. So if it needed to to climb, it would roll wings level and climb, and then continue the turn. So. You would end, it would end up giving you a bigger turning circle. Um, but yeah, most um, route, routes were, very, we did plan them carefully to, to make the most of terrain screening, but also, yes, to take into, into account the fact that it, you know, if, if you're going to turn and you're in the middle of a valley, it was going to be, it was, the airplane was not going to struggle, but it, but it, was, it would prioritise getting over the hill because it, the other thing is it, it had a very, I think it was about, 30 degrees angular bank limit or might be 27 degrees i can't remember what it was now but it wasn't a lot so it would do you know it would do a very very slack turn um anyway and of course if you then if you then had to climb it would roll the wings level to, to, to get the uh, to get the climb in and then, and then roll back in so you'd end up with a massive turn if if you had to so so you would try to to um make sure it didn't have the opportunity to to, to do that um but i you know i, I had every confidence in, in in it and um Certainly, all the flying that I did, both um, you know, in, in at night time. I mean, go through the Highlands of Scotland. I remember going through. Actually, one day we were in Sardinia in Detchimanu, and uh, uh, myself and enough Steve were sent off because the, the, the weather was bad on the range and everything. And they said, "We'll keep you get flying. We'll just uh, we'll send you off on." There was a navigation route, which uh, I think was generally done by starfighters in good weather. And we got sent off on this really crappy day with a howling wind and grey clouds swirling around. And on that, I just remember, well, first thing was, was going on and, and popping out and looking out to our right and seeing this cliff face going whizzing past, thinking, oh, that's close. Um, but again, the airplane's quite happily doing it. Um, and then, yeah, turning, popping out over the sea and then just turning back. And, uh, and I remember thinking it was like a sort of, um, you know, punch drunk um, uh, boxer sort of, you know, as it sort of staggered back around being buffeted by the wind as it's determined to make this turn and point us back towards the, you know, back towards the cliff face again, which it then promptly climbed over and, and was behaving itself perfectly well. But no, I mean, I had every confidence in it, I have to say. And, and it, it was a fail safe. Um, I think um, Adam mentioned it actually, which, which didn't help them very much during the Gulf War. But um, if it sensed anything above the, um, uh, there's, there's a thing called the cram the clearance range head monitor so basically it was it, the, the computer program had this it's like a ski toe um, that it painted out on the um on the radar screen of the side view radar screen and if anything impinged onto that the, the cram then it would initiate a pull-up and so if you end up with really heavy rain or ha hail for example i mean nothing did to me we were going along the bristol channel tfing and we were went under the stub of um cardiff airport and there was an airplane on the approach and the tf saw it went oh my goodness me there's something above the cram line dunk and put us into 4g pull-ups straight towards this airplane so said, no you don't you know disconnect and push it down but um but yeah its reaction to anything it didn't if it didn't understand what was going on it would put you into a 4g pull-up away from the ground so it, it was it was very much fail safe really um Although that might have been fairly unhelpful on a couple of occasions, if uh, you know, if you happen to be over uh, an Iraqi airfield as Adam was, or if you happen to be flying uh, under an airplane on the approach to Cardiff as I was, um, you, you, you talked about uh, battle formation a couple of times. Then, so, yeah. so uh, again, similar question. So, the airplane is not going to be pulling the the four G tactical turns that you would have done in the Hawk. But how do you then uh, make sure that you're still in battle formation when you roll out the turn if you're auto TFing? The basically, if you were auto TFing, you wouldn't, you would react to a singleton. So because because the whole thing about battle formation is, is it's visual cross cover, so you can see behind the other guy. So if you're not visual, then then really your your two airplanes doing your own thing. Um, and indeed, if you were um, even battle formation, if you were heavyweight, the the deal was if you're on your way to the target and you got tapped, then the, basically the formation w w would scatter because you want to get to the you don't want to end up in a dogfight you do want to um get um you do want to get to the target still so if somebody you know, the, one of the, the the back pair was you know, was bounced and everybody else would just run away bravely uh, which sounds a bit heartless but the job was to bomb the target and and we were not a fighter um however you know once you if you did 
if the opportunity did present itself, if you did see an easy shot coming up, or if, if for example, you, you, you'd, uh, you'd be the target on, on the way back, then yes, you had your, your, we had the um, two AIM-9L missiles, which have got a, a, um, a head-on capability, and the airplane would pull 4G. So you know, you would, uh, you know, you could whack it around 4G and um, you know, point your AIM-9 Lima at the you know, anybody who, who was threatening your buddy, and uh, and you could take them out. So. Um, and actually, the nine lima was also very good on the um, on the beam as well, the beam aspect. So, it, it was a you know, it was a potent machine. And and if you were in an environment where you had to had to fight your way through, then uh, then battle formation was yeah was the way to go, and, and you could do it. Um, it TFing in cloud, it's go, again, who's the guy's going to get you is going to be he's going to be a radar fighter anyway, because he's not going to get you there with a, with a heat seeking missile through cloud or whatever. Um, or um, probably possibly not night. So basically, yes, if, if you're the guy who's targeted, then you make your own arrangements, however, whatever that's going to be, and everybody else legs it and, uh, and carries on with the mission. <laughs> did, did you have I wishes you luck in, in, in the TF in a jamming environment? Um, obviously, when when Adam went into Iraq, I'm, I'm not aware of the Iraqis having a particularly sophisticated uh, ECCM or, 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 or sort of ECM environment, but um, how did you think it was going to fare if you had to go over the folder gap, if you were going to go and actually put a bomb on a, an East German or a, a, a Soviet airfield somewhere? Yeah, again, we weren't too sure how it would work. But the thing about the TF, I mean, they, I think they did have TF jammers, um, but the, the, the TF had a pencil beam. It was a very, very thin, narrow, a bit like sort of going down the road with a, with a you know, your, your pen light torch shining it around. And so, in order to jam it, you'd have to be pretty accurate. You'd have to um, sight the jammer such that it was looking exactly down the line of of, of the TFR. So, um, it had some degree, I think, of of, of anti um, um, countermeasure in it. Um, I'm not quite sure how robust that was, but yes, that, that was certainly a question. And one of the big questions really was was also uh, things like chaff. So, if you were going through the target as as number four or perhaps number eight, even because you know, most of our um, our counter air missions were were planned as eight ships, and in fact, probably sixteen ships, because probably an eight ship coming from Larbor, because was the same target shortly afterwards. You know, how much chaff would there be in the air, and what effect would that be? So, undoubtedly, um, that that was a you know a, um, a worry. Um, I guess in much the same as, way as it, it was for the guys in, in the Gulf War, really. Um, but I think we'd all you know thought about it and thought well we'll you know we'll, we'll use the tf I mean, most of germany once you pass the sort of like say the mention the folder gap but you know the bits north of um uh the, yeah the the, the, the um Teutoburger ridge and that was it was flat as, as the proverbial witch's tit so you know you, you would quite happily take the uh, the radar out i think and, and and just fly it um fly it manually if you had to um and i think we all kind of expected to do that and then uh, you know perhaps uh, put the tf in if uh, yeah, or perhaps keep the TF there and just keep an eye on it um, and, and, and use it as a guidance, but it gave you a massive pull-up, double-check. Um, so, yeah, there are certainly things that we, 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 th- we thought about, but, um, but, but not in, 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 in I'm trying to think back to 30 years, not in massive detail, because we, you know, I, I think we generally thought that it was probably unlikely that they, they would be able to jam us accurately enough. You, um, you mentioned that the, uh, the aircraft's not a fighter. I remember... Talking to, I don't know if you know Graham Davis, um, Cracker. I think his his course. No, I don't think. Did an exchange tour with the mm-hmm. uh, U.S. Air Force, flew flew the F-15E, um, and he he said to me, "Well, the, oh, yes. the, the plan is that, that we would, um, if we were intercepted, we would turn around, and then the guy would get a face full of Amram from from the fighter escort behind us." But what was your game plan then, if you did end up in visual range with um, a bad guy? I think it depends really what the. What the bad guys doing? I mean, we did practice a lot. I mean, a lot of our stuff um, in you know training um, in, in Germany was at, you know, either as a um, a bounced pair, so we go off or bounce four ship even, and, and one of our own number would, would come in and uh, you know attack you just in the same way as as, as it happened at Chivna. Um And um, we also would go do fighter field against um, well whatever was out in the um, out in low flying areas. I mean, at that time there were. Um, F-15s out of Zusterberg. There were two Phantom squadrons down the road at um, at, at um, Wildenrat. There were German uh, Phantoms out of um, I think they were um, Hopston, I think, and a bit further north as well. 
So, uh, um, and of course the Dutch flashing around on their F-16s. So there were an awful lot of, of fighters out there. And so we did an awful lot of practice. So both in terms of negating their threats and also uh, in, because, I mean, we, we were not offensive fighters, but certainly, you know, we, we would, we could react. We turn hard, you know, in formation, you know, if, if he committed to one person, then the other one would, would, would come across and, um, uh, and threaten him, so actually had to pull off and honour that threat, or get killed himself. And of course, once he comes off the one, then uh, you know, then the other guy's free to then manoeuvre to, to threaten him as well. So, in terms of that, yeah, we we were, um, I, th- I think, quite competent and quite capable, really, of, of looking after ourselves in that environment. Um, less so in the against radar. Well, again, against uh, most PD radars, um, you know, if you can stick it on the beam, you stick yourself in the Doppler notch, you, it'll lose you. So, um, you know, we, we, we could operate to, to that. Um, most of the stuff we were up against on the other side was, um, didn't have look down, shoot down radar. So and MIG, you know, the, I think perhaps the later MIG-21 might have done, MIG-29 did, but others I think Flanker was just coming in. So, yeah, uh, Fulcrum and Flanker were just coming in, which did have, but most of the other stuff didn't. Um, but again, we weren't sure, and we're not entirely confident that they, the other side were particularly um, able to intercept aircraft at very at ultra low level, which is what we'd be doing. And, and to an extent, that, that's been borne out by, by the facts, I think, really. I mean, I did, one of the books I did recently was, was about the, you know, the, Cold, the Cold War aircraft of, and... Um, it's quite interesting to see, uh, looking at the Soviet um, air defence, um, and it was the PVO as opposed to the, to the Air Force, Tactical Air Force in, in Germany, but I don't think they did any intercepts below about 3,000 feet. So um, if you're doing visual intercepts at an aeroplane that's 100 feet and you're not used to going down below 3,000 and you're used to doing radar vector control, you know, I don't think you're going to necessarily be very good and you're probably going to put yourself in danger, you know, for, for, you know, for uh, so, Fulcrum Flank are different, um, and again, German, East German, particularly the um, the, the, the DDR MiG 21s, I think would have been very. You know, I think they were quite tough um, opponents, and probably been down at low level doing visual caps. But one of the things I, I'd left the squadron, I think it was while I was away. So just after the Gulf War, um, but before I got back to Germany at the end of ninety one. So during ninety one. Um, when the war came down, I think some of the guys at Bruggen thought it would be a jolly good idea if they flew one of their war missions. Now, our war missions are all pre-planned. Option Alpha was um, a massive counter-air campaign against all the um, Soviet and um, East German airfields in East Germany and I think some in Poland. Um, so JP-233 attacks, um, eight aircraft, um, as I mentioned, probably eight from Bruggen and probably another eight from, from Larbrook turning up to all these places. It was all pre-planned and, you know... <clears throat> So I'm, I'm jumping back a bit here, but basically, when the Hooter went at the beginning of war, all the, the aircraft that were required for, for nuclear strike cover would be loaded up with that, but the others would all be loaded, JP-233, ready for option alpha, ready to go, and all, all the planning had already been done, so we were given the, the mission folders with everything we needed in it. We'd be briefed up, and then we'd just wait for the go. Um, and so the guy said, right, let's get all the mission folders out from the, um, you know, from, from the, the combat operations center and let's fly the mission. And then somebody said, well, why don't we, I think they're, I can't remember where they're going to now, Merseburg or somewhere. I said, why don't we ring up the lads at Merseburg and tell them we're coming? And so they, and I think they did. And the disappointment was that not only did they fly it at, at 500 feet, whatever, but, but the, these guys um, from the East German airfield got airborne and they then could not find, despite the fact they'd been told the target and the time over target, <laughs> they were nowhere to be seen. Um, and so I wonder how, how competent and capable they would have been. Um, you know, again, it's difficult to say because uh, you know the fog of war and all the rest of it. But um, I think that we tended to big up um, the Soviets and uh, and the East Germans and and and, and the, the Poles and everyone else. But I'm not necessarily certain how how good they would have been. One of the interesting things that to digress completely uh, that happened to me was when I was at Chivna, we had the the Czech Air Force. So this is 1991. So wars just come down. Two fulcrums. From the Czech Air Force and a L thirty nine an Albatross um, came and did a round of the airfields for I think Lucas Battle Britain and they turned up at Chivna and um, we, we we the crews came to the bar and we were chatting away. But I was chatting to the one guy who spoke English was the radio operator on their 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 Cub, which is their sort of um, uh, Antonov um, support aircraft. 
And I remember saying to this guy as we had a beer, I said, Here's, you know, Here's, cheers, you know, how amazing. Here we are in the bar drinking together. And maybe you know, it's, uh, you know, a few years ago, we'd have been at war and perhaps fighting each other. And, uh, and he looked at me and said, he said, no, I think maybe we, we could have been, uh, even then, we could have ended up on the same side. So again, I'm not quite sure how the Warsaw Pact would have, would have really held together if, if the chips were down. You know, it's, uh, it was an interesting, interesting comment that he made. <laughs> Um, did, did you have good? Um, I mean, I, I, I wrote about the the Rudy was forty four seventy seven test evaluation squadron, which mm. of course ran the constant peg program. So, so this is yeah. a subject that's close to my heart, but uh, and and it's boring that I keep asking people these questions, but I'm really <laughs> keen to explore and understand. Yes, did did yeah. you have any intelligence transfer from the Americans around the capabilities of the Soviet threat aircraft? Did you know the? Did you see the EM diagram for a Big twenty three? Did you know? Um, what the capabilities of, uh, I don't know, an, an AFID missile were? Um, and, and was there in your mind any sort of active transfer of, of, of intelligence between the two nations? Um, there was, and there were certainly um, books um, to be looked at that were held under lock and key that did give quite a lot of information. You say the EM diagrams and all the rest of it, um, I do remember looking at, not really understanding, <laughs> and uh, thinking, oh, that's interesting. Um, but again, I think what we tended to do was to look at the, I don't know, the simplistic picture as aircrew with small brains and go, well, Fulcrum, that's like an F-16. AFID, well, that's a bit like a, you know, like a uh, AIM-9. So if we train against an F-16 F with a, an AIM-9, then that's going to be probably, you can probably read across. Um, and if anything, it's probably going to be, we're probably going to be a bit better off doing that. So I think that's the way we tended to look at it. And we did, we did, um, yeah, we, we we did look at that, but actually, I think that, that I think we were actually a lot more interested in the in the SAM systems, um, and we I think always felt they were the threat, the bigger threat. Um, we felt that the um, again because the Soviet system was based on GCI control um, in a heavy EW environment with our own fighters. Um, although we wouldn't probably wouldn't have fighter escort, although we might have had fighter escort. Um, the we the threat the the high threat for us really was uh, was the SAM um, and not you know again triple A was the big I think the big threat in the um, in the Gulf War but I don't think we really saw that because I, I don't think the Soviets had the massive amount of triple A that the um, that the the Iraqis uh, ha had invested in I, I think they like us had gone more for uh, you know a, a few um, a few triple A systems, but mainly in, into SAMs, and and again, particularly crossing the um, you know the the the, the uh, flot and all the rest of the forward line of own troops, etc. In you know, going through the Soviet ground formations was, I think, when we felt that the threat was going to be greatest. Really, of you know systems like SAM eight, SAM six, um, we felt pretty confident. I think most of the airfields are defended by SAM three, uh, which could had a theoretical sort of low level capability. But again, we were very confident that our own countermeasures and our own low level tactics would keep us clear of those. But things like six and eight, we really were worried about seven to an extent. Although we reckoned that our flares are pretty good, um, but then you got into things like thirteen, um, fourteen, and suddenly things are looking a bit more more, more complex. But yeah, that that was really where our yeah our, our, we we very much thought that that was that was the threat rather than the fighters. I mean, the fighters were interesting to read about, but um, but we didn't um, didn't spend an awful lot of time worrying about it hugely. On a related note, I've, I've heard it said several times that the the radar warning receiver on the airplane was very good. Can can you describe it? Uh, was was that your opinion too? Yes. It, um, in fact, yes and no. <laughs> he said answering the question that that it was it was very good. It was very very clever. Um, in that previous systems um, gave you raw information, so you know tweets and all the rest of it, um, and flashes, um, and so you got to you had to know quite a lot in order to interpret it but i think that once you got that you could interpret it and given the raw information you could then work things out for yourself um the rhwr was very much more complex than that and it would it 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 did all the thinking for you and told you what the system was and it told you where it was um fairly accurately so you you then so you'd <clears throat> The screen was uh, so in the front seat. You you had the, the head-up display and, and and moving mat just beneath it, and then on either side, on one side the e-scope for the terrain-following radar, and on the other side the um, RHWR. So it was, you just drop your eyes, and, and it was there. And uh, and so you uh, and there was a great bit of science. There was then a little bit of um, uh, sort of thin, almost like sellotape 
put a cross on it which showed you the coverage because the um the jammer the sky shadow jammer um had a i think it was a 60 degree arc either size uh, so a 120 degree arc forward and a 120 degree arc so, but but on the beam it was it didn't have uh, it, it, it didn't jam sam radars it had a cw jammer for six eight and for uh, for um ai radars um but so you so if a strobe came up would, would point you in a direction you could then turn the airplane slightly just to if it was just slightly outside cover to put it into jamming cover or you could turn the 90 to get away from it um so again from that perspective it, and i think the, the the length of the strobe gave you an indication of how strong the signal was so you've just moved, you might just get a little, little point which give you something that there's, it's a, probably a long way away um and then it it, it gave you i think it, it told you something's looking at you it told you if it was a target uh, tracker and then it told you it was a missile guidance it sort of gets screamed at you audibly so you'd get uh, you, know, you, you i think you had three yes yeah, somebody's looking at you a target track is tracking you now and the missile guidance is locked onto you were the three things that you had um in terms of audio so that from that perspective it was fantastic i also answered no to your question which was that um it depended on the software like all these things you know, clever computers and i think there were some things it didn't pick up very well so again there was always a, an iterative process where it depended which software you had loaded and what um, you know, what intelligence had come up with was, was how the other side were doing and, and what countermeasures were around. So <clears throat> I think in general it was fantastic, but it, it could catch you out on occasions. Um, more so with the training, because again, I remember things like um, F-15C, I think it, for some reason it couldn't, it didn't pick that up because I, I think because the F-6, sorry, f 15C, I think, because the, the F-15 had this um, either a, a frequency hopping radar or a track wall scan mode or whatever that the, the RHWR didn't pick up. So um, that 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 again, I, I guess probably a little bit later on, the iteration would have sorted that out or, or would have found some way around it. But um, but it, it, it was it, it was software limited. Um, but generally, it was yeah, it was fantastic bit of kit and certainly very easy to use. Um, but again, one wonders well if you had a raw but you know, raw information, would that have um, would that have been better? I don't know. Would you have wanted to be doing that? I mean, especially if you're as a front seater, you know, your job is to not hit the rocks or yeah, yeah, ground yes. or anything attached to it. I think. Yes, yeah, so you stick in the middle. Yeah, stay clear of the edges. They say. <laughs> I suppose in a crewed aircraft, maybe maybe that raw information would be sort of processable by the guy in the back, maybe. Or the... Yeah, although I mean, you know, they were working hard as well. I and mean, the thing about the airplane was that both of you worked. Yeah, the, the the workload was was evenly split. Really, both of you were, were working hard, uh, which is the good thing about it. Really, it it it, it took the workload that, w that one person done in, you know, let's say the Hawk, and, and split it evenly and made it sort of manageable for both sides. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's probably as you say, you know, why uh, why do something yourself if you've uh, if you've got a machine that can do it for you? <laughs> you? You've talked about you mentioned a few minutes ago fighter affiliation. Can you talk a little yeah. bit more about that? Then um, there's a, there's a story in your book about flying against the Dutch, and I think the sort of Dutch getting to the point where they thought you were easy pickings. Um, yeah, well, yes, that that was it. That was in Goose Bay actually, and uh, yeah, well, yes, because they, they did because of course we as I mentioned, in order to get the best of the training, we we plan our routes and and we. In Germany, um, and in this case in, in Goose Bay, uh, there were certain cap points around. So the, the air defence airplanes, the Phantoms from Wildenroth, used to get airborne, and they'd you know, we'd get airborne to fly a route, and we you know we get in the morning and go, oh, we're going to plan this route, we're going to fly this. But for the Phantoms, their tasking was go to you know cap number three or whatever it is, PI mast, and uh, you know sit there for half an hour and just you know shoot there anything that comes. And so that's what their training was. So we would therefore make sure we'd find that, ring them up, and say which cap are you going to today. And they go, we're going to PI mast. So we would then make sure that our route took us via the PI mast. So and say, well, we're going to be there, and we'll be there about sort of you know nine thirty, whatever it was. So they would know that we were coming, and they'd know when we were coming, and all the rest of it. So from their perspective, it's just sitting waiting, you know, waiting for rats to get into the barrel so they could shoot us. And yeah, then we practice all our, our tactics and everything else. Um, and so the uh, particularly the, the Dutch, are, they're, they're quite arrogant, really. And we were in Goose Bay, and we'd done quite a lot of this similar sort of thing. Oh, we'll, we'll route through their caps, get a bit of training from F-16. And of course, they go, yeah, we're fantastic. We shoot you all the time. Yes, whatever. But you know we, you know we're coming, and we're you know, doing it for you and the rest of it. Um, but, it but it was nevertheless very, very useful. But this particular day, what had happened was that one of the ground crew had been doing the after flight servicing, and he noticed that there was this crack in one of the underwing pylons. And uh, the engineers all went, you know, or not, not the but yeah, engineering headquarters. I mean, oh my goodness me! You know, perhaps there's cracks in all of them. So 
uh, you mustn't fly. And I think the boss said, well, if we take everything off the pylons, can we fly them then? He said, well, yes, you can do that, because uh, we need to check the pylons. So we took all, all the, um, the pylons off, off the airplane. And the airplane, so it changed, like, uh, we mentioned very, very early on, you said that you know, the Hawk flew around and, and the tornado um, you know, was you know, perhaps not so, not so agile. And, and, and it wasn't because it was loaded down with loads of you know, tanks and uh, pods and God knows what else, which are quite draggy, um, and slowed it down. Um, but also all those things had speed limits. <clears throat> and um, once you took those off, then suddenly the clean airplane had speed limits, which, I mean, you could go supersonic quite out, you know, within the release to service. Uh, you, know, you, you, didn't, you weren't limited to anything at all other than you know, how fast can, will the airplane go for you. Um, and so basically we got airborne. And, and the other thing I should mention is, is that once you got to those speeds, the airplane became incredibly agile. It was, you know, really, it, it turned itself into a hawk almost, at, you know, it was about 500 knots. And so... We told the Dutch we were coming this day, and we didn't tell them that we were, um, uh, yeah, that, 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 that things were slightly different this, this time. And we were, they were used to us coming towards them at a cruising speed, I say 420 knots, maybe I think it's 450 to go through to a bit, bit of fighting speed. And so they were going around in their little circles, and they're going, oh, the Brits are ming, and then we'll just go around again, and they would get them in the next time round. And what they didn't realize is instead of 420s, we were actually doing something like 600 knots. So <laughs> they came around, and suddenly we'd, we'd gone. They, they, oh, they're gone, where they're gone. <laughs> because we'd actually, as they, they, they turned sort of dead on to us, we'd just gone whistling past. But then it got better because we did our route, we came back, and of course they were still going, where have the Brits gone? And of course by that time, we were up behind them. So it was, <laughs> and there's this wonderful view of the back end of an F-16 thing. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> you know, fire a missile at it. Fox 2, you're dead. <laughs> and they were, <laughs> they couldn't work out what had happened at all. What did happen? <laughs> So it was great. Yeah, we felt fantastic, and they felt like you know, like muppets. But uh, yeah, <laughs> did, all good fun. Did, did you ever do um, any real manoeuvring in relation to other aircraft? Then, um... well, we used to go to a, well, I mean, we used to go to the Air Combat Maneuvering Instrumentation Range at Detchen Marno, which was oh, it's fantastic. It's like um, the, the boy's best toy ever. So basically, you've got if, if it's in, you see it in Top Gun. I don't know if you remember some of the debriefing where um, the, the guy goes, the guts is move over saw, and because in the debrief they're they're playing back the fight that the, the, the guys have just been on, and so and the same thing happened at Red Flag as well. You flew with um, a, a data pod on the airplane, so you'd smack off into the um, uh, off the coast of Sardinia. Uh, with, with a, a you, know, you and your mate with data data pod on, you then split off. This is for a one v one, and so you come cruising in. You do you do your your air combat. So it's all you know good, good stuff, good fighter pilot stuff. Um, you know, turning upside down and putting lots of G and um, playing at being fighter pilots. And then when you landed, you then went back to the debrief thing, and then the whole fight would be replayed. Um, on the screen, and you could stop at any stage. Right, stop. What happened here? Because up till then, most Air combat debriefs were basically, well, or most air combat, should I say, were one in the debrief when you know you could say, well, this happened and the rest of it, and, if the, you know, and, and no two people's recollection are exactly either accurate or, or match. And so, what actually happened was never, well, what was debrief was probably what never would actually happen. So it's very, it was very rare to see, you know, to, you know, to, to get the, the the true answer of what of what had actually happened. Whereas on this, of course, it's all recorded for you, and you could see it in front of you, and there's no arguing. And so it was. It was fantastic, yeah. And and you could stop it. You could you'd switch to a pilot view. So you'd, you'd switch from you're looking at a plan view of the airplane to do a side view, or you'd go into one of the cockpits and see what that guy was seeing, what he's looking at, and redo each fight. And well, we, so we'd start off doing one v one, and then we'd work up and do two v twos. And if there were um, other guys, because they were the, the um, Americans, the Germans. Um, and others used it, so we quite often the Americans say, "Well, you know, can we, we'd like to do some fighting with F-15s." So, and that's usually quite fun because we usually they'd say, "Right, what we'll do this time is is we'd like you to pretend that your bombers at low level, and we'll do our tactics, and you do your low level tactics, and then so that we do that, and then at the end we'd go, right, we're all kind of play fighters now, so we get shot down in about the first thirty seconds." Um, but actually, we did that as well. The French um, Mirages, uh, the Mirage Two Thousand team from Dijon were down there one one year, and so we got fighting them, and it was it was hilarious. I remember the first we did two v two, so um, I'm I'm leading, and um, we, we 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 go into the we 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 head towards the the merge, and we're in battle formation, and um, you know the, the guy um, our, our controller is telling us right there, you know X miles, you know, counting them down, and then suddenly there's. Uh, Fox 2, you're dead, and uh, yeah, no, you're dead too, uh, but we didn't see anything. Well, what happened then? So we then went out and we set up again. Exactly the same thing happened. And, and what if these guys, the, 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 the Mirage is tiny, 
and the guys were coming in and they were just dropping down vertically on us from about 40 odd thousand feet and you didn't see it. and i think on, on about the third one i got this glimpse i thought oh that's what they're doing and then then we worked it out but it had taken that long to work out what was happening um but yes yeah, so there you know once we got in fact one of the one of the best um things was we again had said to the french right uh you yeah, know they, they would put up a pair and we put up a four so we'd be four ship doing low level tactics they do their, their stuff and on the last one they said right we've got we're changing the game this time you're a pair at low level and we're a four ship for fighters <laughs> so, <laughs> so which they thought was hilariously funny so ended up this massive great big um yeah um four v2 with uh mixing it with these mirage 2000s which could turn on a sixpence and were almost invisible to the eye and were, it was just such fantastic fun <laughs> It's great. I, I was going to ask. I mean, it's, it's sort of related, but the camouflage scheme for the tornado was it particularly effective then? Because if they're dropping down on you from forty thousand feet, um, presumably they've got to be visual with you to do that. The, um, they had a very good radar, so um, the, these guys are good air-to-air radar, so they're picking up. Yeah, and it, it also the 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 camouflage was brilliant against what it was designed to be camouflage against so um gray green if, if it's designed against a sort of northern european um uh, 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 terrain and at goose bay um it was brilliant because quite quite what one of the, the sort of schemes if you were the bounce and you could do it in goose bay you go up as high as you have to you know 10 15 000 feet and look down and again i used to do it in the hawk as well if, we, if the airspace allowed it you get up that high and just looking down and you you, see, you, know, you could see little dots of an airplane um except that uh, at goose bay w- with all the, the trees and all the rest of it you couldn't it was very very difficult to see the aircraft except if they flew across a lake because the lakes are blue and suddenly you see this dark airplane if you picked it up then you could follow it and so that was the thing if you if you knew you're on a bounce formation if you came to a lake you'd sort of weave around it and similarly if you were the bounce you're trying to get them to fly over it um so uh, and a medium level again o- over a really dark sea very difficult to see but again if, if there was a slight um you know if, if you're operating above a sort of a, a, a layer of cloud or something then of course you'd be seeing miles off because you were dark against a, a white background so again i suspect again with the mirage pilots that, that we were sitting probably above a sort of a, a sheet of um of, of cloud and that they could see us very starkly against that um so yeah i mean the, the, i think the the gray camouflage that that they had latterly and that um the um you know present aircraft have is, is probably better all round but certainly against um you know at very low level against um northern european terrain it, it was it was very effective actually you mentioned the sea and i'm going to show my ignorance here um but did you have sea eagle did you have the maritime mission at the time no we flying? didn't no that no. that was picked up um i think after the gulf war um the two um to the, the two squadrons at marham one was disbanded and one was 617 which can never be disbanded because apparently that's um owned by the holy ghost or something um <laughs> uh, not, not that i'm bitter and twisted because i was on squadrons that were very senior and did get disbanded but there we go um yeah so 617 was sent up to lossy mouth and what had been 27 became 12 squadron and they had the gr1b and that was equipped with Sea Eagle, and they took over the the role for, from the Buccaneer. But I was never involved in that, and I think that was kind of in the late, mid to late nineties until I think it was taken out of service. I think when GR four came along, um, I think they took it out. So no, I, I never did that, um, and I think I'm quite grateful in a way because I enjoyed flying over the land and uh, you know, flying over the sea is mindlessly boring actually. <laughs> Speaking of weapons, then you know I won't ask you for specifics on the nuclear mm. role, um, but the, the MOD is you know there are WE one seventy seven. I think they're called uh, the tactical nuclear weapons that we. That's have. right. Yes. They're, yeah. Their yeah. museums were open about the fact we had. Them, yes. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. the tornado could carry them. What What can you say about the, the the nuclear mission? And you know, from a pilot's point of view, did you have the same sort of uh, planning processes as other air forces where you would be crewed with an individual and only you guys knew what your target was and you'd sit down in, in a cubicle and do your study and um, the, well the there were, there were there were different there were different bits to it and so the the prime role of the tornado in Germany was as a strike asset uh, and there were various what we call force generation um, levels depending on the coverage of the target list of the, you know, the the NATO target list, and the kind of essential targets were um, were covered all the time. So peacetime um, by nuclear QRA. So that was that was so airplanes at Bruggen. I think we had four 
or maybe five aircraft that were held at 15 minute loaded at 15 minute readiness with the crews briefed with all with, with, with the emission folder and everything else and, and all, all the details um if an exercise was called the first thing that happened was the crews would sprint to the airplanes and check in and then wait to be stood down hopefully because if they weren't stood down they'd be getting able and sort of 15 minutes later to go and nuke the uh, <laughs> go and nuke the commies um so <clears throat> that so at that level it, it, they're a pre-planned option so you did when you did QRA, you went did it for 24 hours so you pitched up you took control of the of the airplane and the weapon system and you then covered that target for the next 24 hours. So if the bullying went up in that 24 hours, then you, the crew, would be going off to uh, to um, drop a bomb on it. Um, so then there was the next level of um, uh, of escalation was uh, what they call a selective use. So this was a sort of kind of demonstration of resolve. So there'd be a selective use, and this we practiced on exercise, and it was generally it was a planning exercise basically. So the um, Headquarters that would decide that a selective use was required. So then a crew was selected, and then the crew, exactly as you said, will be taken off to a secret bunker, be told what their target was, and be left to plan it, and um, you know, and and then go to the airplane, um, and uh, and take it over, and 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 uh, if necessary, fly the mission. Um, so those were the, uh, but yeah, so so those the the third option basically came, at the, which was kind of the time for Armageddon, and. That was when every single nuclear capable airplane or, um, or system actually in, in NATO would be launched. So that was practiced every exercise. And that um, was, I'm just trying to remember the exact, um, the, it was the CLSP, which is the something coordinated launch sequence plan. So the coordinated launch sequence plan was the way that every single weapon system could be delivered to its target without impinging on on the others. I.e., if you launched everybody together, they'd all, you know, and you can remember these hundreds of airplanes. So it was a massive um, planning exercise in terms of deconfliction. Um, and so you can imagine the timing tolerances were, you know, were very exact. Um, and and the, um, you yeah, you couldn't deviate from, the, from track very much either. Um, yeah, you had to basically stick to your track, stick to your time, drop your bomb, and then get the hell out of there before you know, somebody else. And pro and probably on your, I think, depending on, because if you couldn't make the first takeoff time, then there was a recalculation, and you could then go so many hours later, and, and so on and so forth. But each time you stepped back into, you know, if you couldn't make it because the airplane was US or whatever, or, or you were withheld, each time you um, went off, you, 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 know, you, you wouldn't necessarily be deconflicted in time or space. You know, so you, you you would fly over a route which somebody else would nuke at some stage or you know whatever. So that so but you can imagine that, and so this was the whole wing would get airborne. This is a great excitement on the last day of the exercise. You'd come to cockpit copy readiness about four o'clock in the morning, and then you'd sit there waiting for the launch. And uh, you know then probably about eight or nine in the morning, suddenly the uh, they'd announce right. You know everybody everybody's off, and we get this message. It gave all the uh, all the launch codes and everything else and you'd be looking at your book and calculating the times and everything else we've got to go now and you know, you'd come out of the house that you've been locked in for the last you know four or five hours um and see all the other airplanes all nosing out and there's this great sort of scrum as everybody just it was a complete free for all as everybody just tried to get to the runway and blast off and there'd be you know people coming from both sides of the runway and it was um and off we went and then the, it, they're all, again it, the, for exercise purposes it was all designed to end up with a every single airplane going through the range at nordhorn to drop a bomb, first run attack or uh, practice bomb on the range there, um, as a sort of it became a kind of a wing competition almost because obviously you wanted to do as well as you could. So at the you know so at the end of every exercise, you know every airplane on on the wing would go through and drop a bomb, um, and and then recover. So uh, and then of course you'll go to the bar and then wait for the results to come back to find out which squadron had, had done the best. But um, yeah, the the, the nucleus I was was very taken massively seriously um and i've you know i skate skate over the over the details um but you know it was exceptionally tightly controlled exceptionally well controlled and um you know i i, I even now I look back at it and I'm so impressed with with the whole system of how tightly controlled and um you know politically and militarily and everything else the whole system was it was it was a very very impressive system what, what was it like <clears> to <throat> walk into a hangar then has as, as you as you called it, um, and look at the the weapon on on the airplane, or look at weapons on the airplane. Did you, did you get any shiver down your spine? Did you? Yeah. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah. I mean, you look at this thing, and uh, you know, it's a kind of 
the, one of those moments in your life when you are stopped dead in your tracks. It really is one of those moments. The first time you do it, you go, wow, what am I doing? What, you know, what responsibility am I about? to take on um it, well, yeah it was i mean to, to, to see this thing sitting there was um yeah an amazing amazing experience very very sobering and uh you know, for, for all that we were a bunch of immature <laughs> immature boys who used to go around and drink too much and uh, you know all the rest of it um you know that was a sobering moment it really was and, and something that you took incredibly seriously really seriously um you know and, and it was yeah there there were very tight rules about you know even how close you could go to it who could do what there was a man with a gun to make sure if anybody wrote laws he was shot it was, yeah that was that was it cut and dries yeah you do not cross this line if you do i will shoot you fair enough um so you know it was uh, yeah um but, but but yes to see this thing and to sign saying right that is now mine for the next 24 hours um you know we had to do checks on it so actually to be there next to it and check that all the yeah, other everything was done correctly was uh yeah but it was uh yeah i really incredible experience um yeah very very thought provoking and um you know and, and, and sobering as i say did you, did you ever have any um moments sitting qra where you thought you were going to be called or um did, did they test you while you were doing qra Could they, they a- did it was i mean i have to say that on the time that i did it although i did quite a lot i was never actually there when any of the uh, alerts were called so i, I never got the, the you know that sort of uh, oh my god moment and run to the airplane but um i think those that did were you know were, were, yeah it was that well is it is this for real i mean as it was that yeah the hoot used to go off sort of once a month at least usually about three o'clock in the morning and we all were running into work um you know but, and as I, as I mentioned, you know, sort of be, get, get briefed up for option alpha to go and take out whatever our, our target was, conventional target. Um, and again, you did not know because, it, you know, in the sort of late 80s, the, the Cold War was still sort of, uh, you know, it was, it was still bobbing along. And so, you know, it, it really, for the first probably half an hour, you didn't know if you were going to war or not. And it was, you know, and, and oh, oh, guys, it's an exercise. You know, everybody <laughs> relaxed. <laughs> Although that said, you know, usually speed there'd be there'd be evaluators there, so you kind of knew that uh, everything you did was to be watched, and uh, you know, almost that was almost more frightening actually <laughs> than the prospect of going to war. <laughs> would, would you sit QRA wearing uh, fl- your flight suit, wearing a G suit, wearing a poopy suit? Uh, or what, what sort of readiness did you have to have? No, we we're at fifteen minute readiness. We were in the um, the hardened shelter that was in, that was next door. So the aircraft were in their own hardened shelters, and we there was a, a crew um, um, crew briefing facility, and, and, and we had a crew room in there. And actually, do you know, we used to, we used to um, watch videos and uh, and play Risk actually, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and one of the films it is, it is quite funny. One of the films that I've seen numerous times was was Witness with Harrison Ford, and the that was um, a much loved one, not least because um, at the beginning of, of of the version that we had from the um, local services um, cor- cinema corporation or who, who who rented these things out at the time, there was a trailer for Top Gun. I'm again, wow, this film looks amazing because it was just about to come out. So, uh, you know, wow, guys, how exciting is that? And in fact, we then went and saw, we had trooped off to the uh, Ryan's Arm to the cinema to, to watch it when it came out. So, uh, various girlfriends and wives came along as well and watched these, uh, you know, sort of bronzed, um, you know, <laughs> T shaped hulks playing beach volleyball and looked at us and, and thought, where did we go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mike, we, we've got to uh, talk about stuck wing sweep landings, oh, uh, yes. red, red flag, um, and of course Iraq. Um, but I would like to, if it's okay, just draw the line there um, yeah, and come back. Course. Would you be okay with that? Absolutely, yes, indeed, yeah.